Hello there, and welcome back to The Disconnected. I am here with Heather Drain, who has contributed to a number of releases, especially recently, that people are getting their hands on. Heather, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. My sister's name is also Heather, and I feel like that uh, that name is not as common as it used to be, so it's always nice to see somebody with that. We're the last of a dying breed. <laughs> it certainly feels like it. Uh, Heather has contributed to all kinds of stuff, including up to this afternoon, getting an announcement for a Cauldron Films release that you were on. Yes, I'm so excited. The news is out. Talking about, I uh, got to do a commentary track for Frankenstein 80, which is completely bizarre. Italian um, <laughs> horror. It's that was so nutty and fun to do. And I just have two words for you scrotal transplants. Uh, let me pause this and go pre order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I don't even think they need to mention any of the, the supplements. Just like, guys, Frankenstein, scrotal transplants, you know what to do. <laughs> Frankenstein alone, that should be enough to get most people that are into these types of films. There's so many different versions of it. I mean, this isn't even the first one we got this year. Arrow did the one from the 90s and 4K earlier this year. Oh, which I need to get. Yeah, so. same here. I'm still behind. Oh, um, I know. I've, I'm about ready to start like selling some organs at this point. Just yeah, be able to afford some of these releases. I literally, I've always had a full wall behind me. I'm reorganizing right now because I had no space, so I'm trying to take care of some of that. I've got like a a shelf kit in our living room right now that I need to assemble because we are totally. It's starting to look like a movie and bookstore and a music store have exploded all over the house. It's it's nuts. It is a problem <laughs> that many of us share. Uh, one of the other releases mm -hmm. that just came in that you are a part of we have this vortex release oh um that actually um i i know i'm listed on that i did not contribute to it oh damn i i, I literally just got mine in so yeah i, I haven't even been able to open it yet i would have loved to like uh but i think there was like a misprint or something now there is an upcoming uh release that um Game by charlotte or Jane by Charlotte. Yes, yes. And um, you're now officially, uh, you may have to co-manage my my life here with the great Bill Ackerman of supporting characters. Bill is, he got the, the managerial job first. I cannot pay you guys in money because uh, I'm a writer, <laughs> but I can pay you in love and glory. So. But that's enough. Uh, that's <laughs> and to be what I get paid for <laughs> anyways, because it doesn't work out any other way. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that you've been a part of recently. One of the ones I'm most excited for, though, is Dr. Caligari. <gasps> yes, out. you and me both. How, uh, how involved in that one were you? What can you tell me about Caligari? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, I... <sighs> Like my journey with the career of Steven Sadian goes way back um, to when I was like a kid and our local library had a copy of Danny Peary's Cult Movies 3, which is a wonderful tome and it had a chapter on Cafe Flush. And even though one of the pages was tore out, um, because this was a, this was, uh, for, any, for any younger, anybody that grew up with the internet, this will probably not connect with you but there was a time and place where especially smaller town kids were very desperate for nudity um and so any hint of boobs or nipples in a book sometimes those pages would end up missing at the local library and that is exactly i think what happened uh but even with just reading like the partial chapter i it always stuck with me and i always was like you know, even though, I mean, I was like 12, I think, 11 or 12. I obviously had no knowledge of like the more adult end of cinema. And, right. uh, but, but there's something about the story and just the description of the visuals that always stuck with me. And years later, I get to my mid twenties. I finally am able to get kind of my hot little hands on some of Steven's films. And the thing with Dr. Calgary, it's been out of print um, it had a VHS release uh, way back in the day. It, it was, of course, re released initially theatrically, um, right. but that's been it. It was on a gray market DVD, um, which was not a release approved by Stephen, um, that you had to go through a legit porn site. And Dr. Calgary's rated R. It's not adult. It's not explicit. Right. I mean, it's adult in the same way that maybe like I Midnight mean, Cowboy is adult. Like, it's not made for children, but it's not like, a, it's, there's no like actual explicit sex in it. But um, so to have this release and especially the remastering, um, which um, all of this, we have to give major credit to Daniel Bird, who has done such a great job with helping 
you know, restore and keep the legacies alive for filmmakers like uh, Valerian Bor Borovchak and um, Andrei Zulowski and now Steven Sadian. And Daniel is one of the good guys. Like he doesn't just do great work. He is a good human. And I over the years have been very, very, very lucky to get to know Steven. And like Steven's a great guy. Like he's a genius. This man is a legit genius. And he is the most humble human being like this man whose imagination and mind has come up with some of the like and if you've seen any of steven's stuff cafe flesh night dreams yeah. dr calgary party doll go go um any of the stuff he did for in his era of hustler i mean you could tell like this there's no other cat on the planet <laughs> like steven's <laughs> alien and um and when I saw Calgary, like after reading about it, and I actually back in the day tried to order it from that janky, dirty site, and they wouldn't ship it to me because I I'm from Arkansas. And uh. but what's weird is when I bought Cafe Flesh, I had no problems. It was a different seller. So yeah. uh, a little weird, right? And um, but that was an actual official at least release. Um Though, I mean, not that most ideal release, but it was legal, you know, not right. this like gray market stuff. But um, Dr. Calgary is just like, I mean, it's sort of a loose sequel, you could say, to the uh, cabinet of Dr. Calgary, the, the classic German expressionistic film. But um, it's, you know, the film is a gift for the eyes, but it's a gift for the mind, too. There's all kinds of great subversive cultural commentary in it. Amazing acting great soundtrack some dialogue that will worm its way in your sweet little brain and you'll just want to hug it and quote it consistently it's just the perfect cult movie it's got such a quirky look too it's one of those things that the moment you see it you just want to like be in that thematical area for a while just to sort of ingest it as part of your life it it's one of those things that i am still like not believing that it's going to be here until it's in my hands. I, I am so stoked that Jared and everybody has been able to do this. Not to mention, it seems to have been pretty damn successful. I, I think they're on the verge or did just sell out of the limited edition finally. And uh, yeah, they've they've been killing it over there this year at Mondo Macabro. Oh my gosh. Well, and and I love this. Uh, Mondo Macabro do such beautiful work. Like yeah. Jared and Pete Toombs, which I mean, for all of us weirdo, Film people, Pete Toombs, like wrote one of our Bibles, yeah. you know, with his with his book of moral tales and and of course Monte Macabro. But um yeah, they did great. Um I will say my essay is only in the limited edition release. So for any of you latecomers, I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Message me, I'll send it to you. I don't know. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. So great. um <laughs> but uh but it's it's a pleasure to be it. I love Steven is my favorite like director. I mean, I've been working on a book off and on for years about his art and, you know, he's just, I think he's one of the most compelling American uh, filmmakers and artists um, that have come out in the last like, you know, hundred years. I mean, yeah. he's one of a kind. So uh, these contributions, you, you've done quite a few, you've done uh, a lot of written essays, you, you're doing some commentaries now. How did you originally get into that whole industry because everybody seems to have this weird unique journey to get into contributing to some of these releases um it's always a it's for me it's been a mixture of you know because i've been a, a film writer for right. several years now and you know, i started off writing um for like for some very cool zines towards the, and that was towards i mean and that was after the zine movement was gone but they're you know like the real passionate, the strong, the warriors of the zine yeah. movement, you know. Um, and then, like, I wrote for a site called Cult Cuts, and then, you know, Video Watchdog, Dangerous Minds, and so on. And so that helped kind of definitely get me out there. Um, just that's the thing I always tell anybody, like, how if everybody's like, how do I get to A, B, or C? Get yourself out there. Get your work out there. Don't be, you know, don't be stalkery about it. You know, don't be obnoxious. But get your work out there and just do it the best you can make it yours don't worry about trying to be like anybody else because that is a failure in the spirit and the yeah. and certainly the career um i'm trying to remember what was the very first supplement i did because there's a few that i've gotten because i've been some of them have, i've been very lucky because like when i did the i got to co um kind of co-commentate like releases like demons and toys are not for children with the great cat ellinger and those two were in times square too because cat was like 
I, you know, Heather, come on board. And I'm like, hell yeah, yeah of course. You know, um, you know, a few others, like I did one, I did an audio commentary for Cecil Howard's Firestorm uh, released through Distriprix. And that was yep. one where uh, Stephen Morowitz, who runs it, who's a great guy. I mean, him have known each other for years. Um, he knew how much I love Cecil. I've written about Cecil's stuff. And he, all, he was like, do you want to do the commentary? And I was like, uh, that's only on my bucket list. Yes. <laughs> yes, please. Um, with Calgary, like I knew Daniel and I know Steven and, you know, I've been writing about Steven's work, not just on the book, but just in articles for year. I mean, going back to like mid 2000s, like wow. I, I wrote about Cafe Flesh for like a Little Rock paper, <laughs> like, <laughs> so like very write or die here. Um, so it, it depends, like each one's a little different, like some, um, some have been because someone attached to it's been very generous, like Kat. Yeah. Um, others have been because I've known somebody. I think uh, with Frankenstein 80, part of that, Chris, you know, I know, I know, like, the guy, like, I love Diabolic DVD and everybody, if you're a cult film person, please go through them. They're wonderful people. And their inventory is ridiculous. Like, oh, oh my yeah. God, it's obscene the amount of money. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can spend um but they um but they actually had some people on twitter they put out a call asking people who do you guys think you want to see more in the, in the supplemental realm and some very very kind people that i totally did not pay because again i stress i'm a writer <laughs> <laughs> um i mentioned my name and they reached out and they were like would you like to do frankenstein 80 and i was like i was like yes of course um and uh, so it's just like that. It's sort of like case by case. Sometimes it's, you know, rooted in stuff I've written about previously. And so they're, you know, they're like, oh, I've seen you've covered this before. Would you like to do this? Um, you know, uh, so it's just it's like a little bit of a mix. I don't know. Does that answer the question? Well, of or? course. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is something that uh, I, I get asked all the time because so many mm -hmm. people that I've had on here and I've I've talked to Kat multiple times. I've talked mm -hmm. to lee gambin i've talked to troy howarth nathaniel thompson all those guys oh, yeah. uh, most of them have just been uh prolific that, that's the main thing to look at oh my god that crew holy yeah. cannoli oh my god cat cat and lee alone have done more <laughs> if they both retired now they will nobody will ever catch up like they yeah. are i look i look i like bow down <laughs> and and troy and nathaniel too like these are yeah, these are amazing like content creators. It's so cool to to see how many different voices and people we have in this field, you know. Yeah. And and I'm glad that it seems to be expanding a little bit because even, you know, 8 years ago it wouldn't be as diverse as it is now. We wouldn't oh. have the ability to have a lot of these women stepping forward <laughs> and contributing. We wouldn't have a lot of the people of color like uh Sergio Mims who just recently passed away, he got to do a lot mm -hmm. of stuff before he passed and uh, yeah, there, there's just so much that we are able to get. And really, the reason is because we're getting so many of these releases. And we have, you know, literally hundreds of releases coming out a month and five people can't cover them all anymore. Right. Well, and I think the thing that's so cool is like, I always think it's so healthy to have, like, you should want several different types of voices and of perspectives in, in any scene because it's i mean that's the beauty of art in general is the way it can connect to each person like that's the right. you know that's always why i've never understood like gatekeeping because i'm like well if you really love an artist sometimes it's kind of neat to hear different perspectives you know it's um like that's one of the things about doing film like if you're on a film podcast sometimes it's kind of neat if somebody doesn't like the movie you love because yeah. even if you still and obviously you're still going to disagree with them but you know if it's civil and it always i mean in my experience usually the podcast it is <laughs> twitter and social media is different <laughs> but um but it's just like to see something through somebody else's eyes and lens too and i think that's always really really healthy and um and you know if somebody's cool and got great ideas heck yeah bring them on board you are incredible at segues, and one of the things that we were going to be talking about tonight, uh, I, I try to stress the entitlement that seems to exist in this hobby from everything from shipping delays, which the amount of complaints I've seen today about Air 4444's newest batch going out that everybody's mm -hmm. complaining about, to uh, Jared Amando Macabro has literally gotten death threats from somebody in some other country because uh, he gave them the tracking information and it just wasn't there yet. And if they waited a little longer, it would have got there. So uh, I... Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, I'll be psycho, people. Jesus. Like, I figured that we would talk about some of the uh, experiences we've seen in the the industry, the hobby, some of the uh, ideas of gatekeeping and how it can be harmful to people and what we can do to mitigate that. So uh, what are some examples of gatekeeping that you've seen fairly recently? Oh, boy. Um <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, especially because like I'm a huge music fan too, and I I, yeah. I also do music writing, and um and like both music and film tend to attract like oh god like flies to to shit <laughs> like oh yeah massive gatekeeping, and it can range anywhere from you'll have somebody you know get into my favorite. I don't think we see this as much now, which is good. But when zombies were super big, I mean, I've I, in person, I've heard debates over and people like serious, like did serious being like, oh, that's not a zombie movie. Right. This is zombies do this or that. And it's like, they're not fucking real. They're not real. You cannot apply science to zombies. Yep. You know? um, or, um, and I think this is one I alluded to an email with you as, um, the whole like shaming kind of culture and it can go kind of both ways where it's like, I mean, I know, I know somebody that um, she actually was like, if you, if you like Woody Allen's films that I'm not talking to you and it's like, like, damn girl. Like, I mean, that's the thing. If like, if we're, if we're going to, and this is the truth and it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but if you're going to hold a high, like, or even a decent moral standard, to everything you listen to, everything you read, everything you watch, your like your library of culture is gonna get really crazy small, you know. And you know that's the thing is I know a lot of people like don't separate the art from the artist, but I mean, you know, it, it's people like to see things very black and white in life. But the thing is, like sometimes somebody that can do something really terrible can make something of beauty, can make oh, something. Yeah. It, it can do a, a, a good deed. Like one of the, you know, like if you, even in history, like the, like there's this horrible incident um, during World War II era. And I promise this is as dark as I'll get, but um, called the Rape of Nan King is awful. Like if you read anything, it's was, it was just absolutely just chilling, awful stuff. And there was a German, you know, a German officer that was trying to help save some of these families that were getting brutalized by the Japanese. He was technically a Nazi. Like he was, you know, now, does that mean, oh, okay, it's, you know, is that saying you're okay with Nazis? No, of course not. Fuck Nazis. <laughs> you know, like, fuck that. Fascist, fascist in general is awful. Like, no, no, no. But you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, you know, I'm not a, personally, I'm not a, I'm not a Woody Allen fan, just as a, even just as a filmmaker. Right. I mean, I like Casino Royale. He didn't direct it. I, um, but I love David Niven. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, Annie Hall was fine. I don't, I'm just not, he's not my flavor. But, you know, there's plenty of artists I love that would I let them babysit my plants, right? much less a child? Fuck no. Oh, my God, no. Now, I, I, I don't get me wrong. If somebody that is currently living or active, if they do something illegal, put them in prison. I don't think yeah. there's any argument about that. Like, but as far as, like, shaming people, like, oh, how dare. Like, I actually, like, heard somebody, like, rip apart a movie I love uh, called Teriyama's, as a Japanese director, Suji Teriyama's, his movie Fruits of Passion, just because Kinski. Like, they they they, didn't, they could not get over Kinski being in it. And it's like, well, that's sad. Because that yeah. movie is, it's art. It's beautiful. It is poetry. It is sad. And it's supposed to be sad. It's not supposed to be this erotic film. It's not erotic. It has nothing to do, I mean, like, this is the human condition. And, you know, was Kinski, you know, did Kinski do some, more than likely did some really horrible, heinous shit? Yeah, I would not surprise me. I've read both versions of his book, <laughs> <laughs> but I love him as an artist. I, I, I think it's fascinating to me about our humanity that people can, we have this duality in us. It right. doesn't mean you're excusing shitty behavior, not at all, but to be so firmly black and white, I mean, your heart's going to be broken. Like, cause like, there'll be like politicians that you think are the hope, but you found out, Oh, one of them gave money to big pharma. Yep. And it's like, maybe don't support them, but it's like, but why don't you apply that to art? Cause plenty of people turn a blind eye with other fields, but with filmmakers and you know, I don't know, I'm probably rambling at this point. No, I, what do you, what do you think? If, like, if we didn't do that, I, I mean, 
if we couldn't separate it, every single film mm. would be canceled at some point. There are so many hands that touch mm. these films. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, somebody's library getting minuscule. It would be down to zero. It's impossible. <laughs> the number of people, unless you're talking about a film that's only been touched by four people, you might have a good chance to be able to watch right. that one still, but pretty much nothing is in that realm anymore. Uh, but to get back to what you originally said, yeah, the shaming is getting ridiculous. Uh, people... Uh, blasting people online for owning Jeepers Creepers, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's so it's so silly. It doesn't make like... any sense. Like, uh, obviously, owning that film is not saying what the director did is okay. It's not saying oh. I want to donate money to his cause or anything like that. The mm -hmm. dude's already been paid, and and there are literally fifty plus other hands that worked on that film. They deserve to have their work seen by the world as well. It's not something mm -hmm. that we cancel just because of one person that shit in the pool basically right yeah no exactly and you know that but also to go after people i feel like a lot of that's just kind of unnecessary chest beating because it's like yeah. if you're that passionate and you want to see change in this world which we all do like of course but instead of like lambasting somebody who loves a film or a, a muse you know piece of music or a book or you know look at your politicians like look at the people yeah. that are actually in power and demand change from where it really needs to start like the most offensive film in the world is still just a film it's still at its core yeah. a strip of celluloid or tape or a file you know you need to look at the people that are actually in charge the one percent your government officials you know whoever's in power your religious leaders um and and demand that going online and you know coming after somebody because they have cheaper scrapers. I mean, the world's on fire. People, come on, pick and choose your battles. <laughs> you I, I think we had a, a film that came out this year that really impressed me. That took this idea on. I don't know if you saw it, but <laughs> Bodies, Bodies, Bodies this year was very impressive as a satire for me because it seemed like it took this Gen Z idea that was kind of changing from the millennials of like this public exercise of apathy where a lot of millennials went for years saying, I just don't care. Whatever happens, I'm just, I'm so cool. I don't care. And mm -hmm. now this public exercise of empathy where people are just outwardly trying to portray themselves as the most empathetic person. And that alone doesn't solve a damn thing. You saying that you care publicly mm -hmm. doesn't get anybody more rights, doesn't get anybody equal coverage, doesn't get anybody uh, any sort of equity in this world. We need to actually exercise that in a way that causes change. And Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'm, words, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, this might sound funny for, as a writer, but I mean, words are vessels. Words are, are absolutely without action and heart and vision behind them. It's empty. Anybody can go online and say something. What are you going to do? At the end of the right. day, what is the action you're going to take? And, you know, I mean, and that's why writing is important, because when you write something, you're putting that and you're doing the action. But I'm, when I say writing, I mean, actual like, you know, you are creating something. It's not just right. tweeting at somebody being like, you know, you, you suck. LOL. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, um, you know, it, it, it's no, I mean, you know, create some art. I always said I used to I, I years and years and years ago, I worked um, at a public access station and my a manager I had at one point had the best like tactic. If somebody complained uh, about the, the content, because that's the thing we were very much like free speech amendment, like, you right. know, fighters and. And she was, you know, she was right. She's like, well, the First Amendment has to protect everybody. And, and that includes people you don't agree with. In fact, it especially <laughs> a lot of times. Yeah. And but if somebody complained, oh, I'm offended. She's like, well, come on down. Why don't you make a show that you would like to see? And I kind of I've always loved that. I'm like, if somebody if somebody really if you hate like a, an article you read, and it made you mad. Why don't you write your article? And I, and I mean, make it good work on it. Don't just shit out something that's just vitriol. Don't contribute yeah. to the, the further toxic cesspool of people just, you know, bitching. Like, you can vent. Don't bitch. Vent. Create. You know, like, anger is an energy. But use it wisely. That's, that's always my thing. But yeah, and gatekeeping is also, uh, you know, can take, like, that form of where somebody's, like, you know, people get a little elitist with each other. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, even like within the tiny little tiny community of us, like, you know, cult, you know, esoteric film people, like, you know, I mean, um, and it's, and it's just like, it's so silly. It's like, man, 
most people, and I've joked about this with friends of mine, somebody, you know, me and you could be like, oh man, did you see that Jean Roland film? You know, did you yeah. see that's coming out? And we're like, sight. But if we go to our day jobs, you know, how many people in our offices or factories or restaurants or wherever are going to be like, oh, fucking A, Lips of Blood's getting 4K? Like, none of them. None of them. <laughs> and if you work at that place, let me and Ryan know, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we will put in our, our CVs <laughs> ASAP. Um, so it's more, so it's, to me, it's definitely important for us to kind of take care of each other as a community and just be like, you know, even if we disagree, that's cool. But, you know, don't be shitty. Don't be a dick to each other. Everybody has different opinions. If somebody doesn't like Sean Roland, but they're obviously, they know who he is, that's fine. Not everything's going to be for everybody. I mean, I have friends that love Woody Allen's films. That's fine. I'm not going to shame them. I'm not going to be an asshole because don't be that. <laughs> you know, it's just art is for everybody, but no art is for everybody. Yeah, and or any any art that's good, at least. <laughs> not to mention these these physical releases are literally turning into educational pieces for a lot of people. These younger generations, mm -hmm. people that are you know twenty three buying a special edition release from Arrow on something, a lot of them have never heard of Jean Roland. They they don't know oh. what fascination is. They don't know who Brigitte Lahey is. They they don't know any of this. They they're sitting there learning and that's where you know people like commentators and essay writers and these visual essays that cat ellinger does for imprint releases they are so important because it provides that context to give somebody the the gate that they can enter not be kept out of but the gate that they can enter to furthering their love of cinema and the amount of people that have shut people down it, it doesn't make any sense to me the art being subjective alone is going to make it difficult because people get passionate about every end of the spectrum, of course. Mm -hmm. And when you come to something that is subversive on purpose or protest cinema or something that is made to piss people off, it's going to get worse. Uh, I, I mean, even something like Gaspar Noe's films where there's mm -hmm. scenes in there that people find difficult to watch. It's going to be somebody else's favorite movie. And I, I'm sure you've never seen it. It's something that I, I say on, on this channel all the time is that every single film has been somebody's favorite film. No matter how shitty you think it is, you don't matter necessarily. You're not the one that that movie is made for. So there's somebody out there that might worship at the ground of this release and you just saying, no, this is terrible. I'm never going to buy it. Who are you helping? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's just, I mean, all, you know, that's the thing. It's like, I feel like at some point it's almost like white noise. Yeah. When you get that many people and it's like, they're not even, and that's the thing you can kind of hay on something in a fun way. If you're funny, if you're clever and if you're a little cheeky, like I, I remember, um, Oh gosh, what film was it? A Paul Thomas. An no, um, Mike McFadden, the great late Mike, um, who, you know, we love you, brother. And he did a piece on, I believe it was on uh, Panos Cosmatos's Mandy. And it was, he hated that movie. Now, I haven't seen Mandy, which is weird because I've written about Beyond the Black Rainbow, which I, I'm, that film is another writer die for me. I love that film. But, um, but Mike's like passion and his funniness, like it wasn't just somebody just being shitty or trying to make right. himself look like the bigger man. It was like, it was almost sort of like what you'd see, like somebody like Lester Bangs or uh, Hunter Thompson, you know, like, if, but you have to be that good to do that. Like that's yeah. something like, I don't advise that just anybody to do it. Um, because if you can't be funny or clever or cheeky with it, and also be kind of knowing that you're being a little over the top too, like, uh, like I'll make a joke about Don Henley being like, you know, one of Satan's like little, you know, semen babies. <laughs> and yeah, you know, am I being over the top? Absolutely. Do I have friends and family that love the Eagles? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I still love them. I'm not going to judge them. I mean, I'll make, I'll, I'll be a little snarky, but snark with love. That's always what I stress to people. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be, we're not right. hippies. It's That's fun. what I was going to say about Mike. He would never <laughs> write that piece and then say, if you like that movie, you're a piece of shit. No, 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 no. He, the, 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 he has the biggest heart. And, um, you know, it's just, that's the thing, different things that people differently, you know, just uh, don't, yeah, this whole gatekeeping. And you're so right. Like every film, like, I mean, I, <laughs> I once had, you know, when I was in college, I worked, I, I worked at a, a store, like a chain store that had like a music 
movies and books section in the video rental section there was a an older gentleman that came in and he was pissed because we did not have i think it was either karate kid three or the next karate kid i'm not <laughs> joking he was mad he was probably on a watch list now that I'm saying this out loud, but, <laughs> but he actually said, well, that's okay. I'll go across the street. Cause at that point, this dates the story severely. There was still a blockbuster across the street. And I was like, we don't get commission. Right. <laughs> like, it's, re it's retail on the, sh on the most minimum wage level. Okay. I, I was like, cool. I hope they have it. So, I mean, he really, he got that mad about a karate kid sequel, not even two. It was either the third one or the next. I can't remember what it was now. It was that like ridiculous. So, but that was obviously a film that meant a lot to him. Would I vouch for it? No, but it's not meant for me either. So, nowadays in this hobby, uh, there's been this big debate that has cropped up multiple times in the last year about the difference between collectors and film lovers. And mm -hmm. what I've tried to argue why does it matter? Uh, if people are doing something they love and they're not hurting you, and they're not hurting themselves why why does that matter uh if some of these people are just a fan of physical media and holding on to it maybe they never open it doesn't bother anything if somebody loves all of these films or hates them all doesn't change anything for you i, I i'm curious to see if on the con on the contributor's side if if you get any sense of that because there seems to be a little bit of a tide change on in, in regards to some of the collecting that's an interesting question um like as somebody, and I don't know if it's because as far as like other contributors, I'm, I'm probably still kind of like a baby compared to yeah. a lot of, uh, definitely compared to all the names you mentioned. <laughs> Cause I'm like, I've done this many, you know? And, and, uh, but, uh, I don't know if I've really noticed on that. And I mean, just as being a film person and a film lover over the years, yeah. I mean, my favorite, <laughs> my favorite example and i'm not hating because i'm like if you've got the funds to be able to do this much purchasing i'm honestly a little envious but i'm good on you Definitely. you know like good for you like hate the game not the player but <laughs> like when um and i'm trying to remember if it was grindhouse releasing like when when the uh when they released pieces and there were i think limited edition ones that had puzzle pieces yeah but you know, but some people started bitching because they were buying multiple copies trying to put the pu <laughs> the puzzle together. But sometimes they keep getting the, <laughs> the same puzzle. <laughs> and I mean, those were not like these are nice releases, so they're not yep. cheap. It's not like you know the you know I'm trying to think of a company like uh, Crestwood, you know, or anything like that. Like you're you're you know, it's a quality release, so you're spending quality money. Right. But um. But I mean, it didn't make me mad. I thought it was kind of funny. I was also like, damn, you're able to spend like over a hundred bucks on cop multiple copies of the same movie. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, with collectors, I mean, these boutique labels aren't, I mean, I mean, they're not pulling in a crap ton of money. Nobody's gonna be able, right. nobody's buying mansions with any, you know, with the money these Mabels like real make realistically so if people want to collect even if they're not watching them you're giving money to these companies that are help preserving and restoring key films that otherwise would be neglected um and kelp and keeping that preservation train going but also speaking to what you had mentioned like educating because we do i think people write off younger generations and but that's bullshit because it's every generation says the same thing i mean people like I'm technically millennial, but I'm what they call a geriatric <laughs> millennial. Like, that's awful, fucking awful. Why don't you just call us like necromantic millennials or something? You know, but um, but I mean, every, every you know, people said that about you know, you know, Generation X. They're saying about Generation Z, but like, whatever. It's the same shit. It'll you always know? happen. Exactly. Um, there's always going to be people, and I think especially now because people, you know. Right now, we live in such a weird cultural time where, you know, people stream a lot of stuff, but it's always yeah. kind of the same. Like you hear, oh, did you binge this show or binge, you know, it's almost like it's kind of like a buffet approach uh, to culture, which I'm not knocking per se. It's just interesting. It's just a little different. But I think people, you know, most people get, you know, if you eat the same thing, you get tired of it and right. you want something different. I think most people are intelligent and I think you know, even if they don't know who these filmmakers are, they just need kind of the right sort of little seed planted to be like, that looks interesting. 
yeah. I'll have to check that out. And when you can do that, it's like the coolest feeling. Like any anytime, you know, I've been able to get somebody interested in something because of an article or whatever, that's like the best feeling because it's like, you know, it's a man. And that's also like, and this probably sounds really pretentious, and I apologize if it does. Like <laughs> to me, that's also like a part of preservation because you're keeping the story going. You're keeping oh, yeah. That's not pretentious no. at all. That, okay. That's the whole idea of archival. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and that's what physical media is at the root of it. This is such a unique time, not only because of streaming, but a lot of the people that made these films are not going to be here a whole lot longer. So the fact yeah. that we're able to literally speak on these films and in many cases get them on the disc with an updated interview or uh, you know some sort of questions answered and then the liner notes or something that's not going to be available a whole lot longer on many of these films that we've all grown up with. So it's huge to take that and just archive the context because otherwise the same thing, history will repeat itself. It's our job to learn from a lot of these uh, actions. And, you know, if you hate Klaus Kinski and the way that he acted, make another movie and treat people better. The, the, the context behind that is the way that we can learn about it. Absolutely. No, I love that because it's, I mean, I, I remember a guy I worked with who actually was the rare kind of cool film person. So it was like, he was like my film buddy, but he came to me one day and he's like, Heather, did you hear they canceled John Wayne? And I was like, <laughs> didn't life do that? Yes. He's dead. What? what is the use of canceling people? They're dead. It's too late. Like also people are shocked that John Wayne said something racist. Like really? Right. I'd be shocked if he didn't. <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, he had one of the a few of the most public <laughs> times of ridicule because of stuff like that. That I yeah. Yeah, even then people were like, "Dude, shut up! Like you're being racist." <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, exactly. Do you know better? You do better because all all we can truly affect is the present and the future. So let's you know preserve the past and and like you said, learn from it. I love that because it's you know I think sometimes people tend like well I say people companies try to whitewash it's like you know i know like yeah. disney of course obviously didn't put song of the south um on their their disney channel i think they should have because like if you try to whitewash your own history you are basically denying that yeah. people were treated a certain way that were you know discriminated against and hurt and um and that's bullshit like own up to it like that's the the thing and the, and the flip of that too it's like now i mean there are obviously there are there are levels to things like if somebody said something offensive and you know but it was like something they said like 10 years ago and they've changed everybody changes who's the same person 10 years ago people i do think we need to allow people the chance to grow um i mean obviously if you're out raping and killing people it's a little different but you know um but like but trying to just actually change history and almost act like oh oh we we're gonna act like we didn't do that that makes it worse that literally makes it worse and that to me is actually even more offensive i have infinitely more respect for somebody especially for a company like disney it's not gonna hurt them they have more money than god okay yeah. like they literally own ever almost every major property at this point and that and that is the era we're also living in where things aren't you notice they're not film series they're properties they're franchises everything kind of Content. has yeah it's corporate speak and which is weird but you know it is what it is uh but uh but i mean it wouldn't hurt disney if anything i think right. it'd make them look good to be like you know what we're going to acknowledge our our history that has some shady stuff in it but oh, yeah. we're gonna acknowledge it and and you know what hell release that shit on blu-ray and give the money to a charity give it to a nonprofit. have part of the proceedings oh, go to benefit like a great charity and nonprofit that benefits african-americans in this country instead of just acting like it didn't happen when everybody knows it happens it's too kind. They would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> I better be careful. The mouse can hear us. <laughs> of course. Always listening. Uh, but the, the archival aspect and this physical media, that's one of the important things behind this too, because with the fact that you're holding the disc, there's no censorship for that. You, you are holding the art in your hand. And that's why supporting a lot of these companies is so important because it is literally preserving. Uh, obviously, we talk about archival a lot on this channel, but preserving is, is something that's important. I mean, 30 Rock, that big NBC show, they, they just deleted a couple of episodes on streaming because they felt like it basically to take out uh, uh, some risky blackface or something like that that was done mm -hmm. in comedy. And the people that bought the Blu-ray the year before, they still have the episodes, thankfully. So it's nice to support this because otherwise uh, you don't know what, yeah. which of these will lose forever. 
Exactly. I mean, that's, I think that's the thing that makes me the most nervous about streaming right now is, is especially like newer stuff that hasn't had a physical media release because, yeah. I mean, it's weird. It's almost like we're going back to sort of like the early TV era where people would recycle tapes, they would reuse yeah. tapes. And so you end up losing like a lot of your archive. And I fear for that because I think preservation is important for everything. And I mean, even, you know, especially because people don't take it for granted. Like that's the thing, you know, and I love, I mean, there's plenty of stuff I stream. Like I, you know, I stream content every day, like the rest of us, but I also support physical media. I mean, obviously, I mean, my, uh, the camera's kind of lower, but like, right below the waist, there's like shelves of a mess. That's why you can't see it. I purposely because <laughs> I need to organize it. But no, I mean, and, and that's the thing. Like if I use Spotify, if there's an album I listen to, I don't have, and I love it, I buy it. And I think that's a great way to use streaming is to use oh, yeah. it to educate yourself and support these and really support these. Spotify is not helping any of these artists out financially, but use that tool to help you make a good decision as a, as a, a listener uh, and a consumer. And support these artists and definitely with movies, but with this whole streaming thing, I do worry. Like, I hope, like, I hope that's not the case, but I mean, it, the thing, like things aren't on physical media. So like if a file gets deleted, right. You know, that's a little, you know, I mean, technology is great, but people are so quick to jump on new things that it kind of throws the baby out with the bathwater in terms of archive, oh, yeah. I think. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's something to be, be important of i do think there's always like i see people discuss that which i think is hopeful and um there's always hope obviously but i just, I just think about like there are films that are lost that aren't even that old oh, like yeah. like there's um my, one of my favorite filmmakers is michael finlay um and like he made a 3d <laughs> he made a this is so i'm laughing because it sounds so amazing and i don't i can't see it i'm hoping right. i'll be if I'm proven wrong and somebody digs it up, hell yes. Like, so I'm almost kind of doing this as a test. But, like, he made a 3D adult film called Funk. And it's like, I mean, what? Like, the man that gave us, like, you know, the ultimate degenerate and Christopher Flesh made a 3D movie? Give that to me. Like, hell yeah. You know, and that's the thing, but it was lost. I think the thing, I mean, when these companies, when people didn't even take good care of mainstream films, when you're dealing with cult films, right. It's a miracle. They thank God we have these boutique labels that are, you know, and, and before them, and this may be not the most popular take, thank God for bootlegging. Cause some of these films yep. people wouldn't have known about without bootleggers or gray market sources. I mean, even Dr. Calgary, like, you know, um, which wasn't ideal. And I didn't get that DVD for the record. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just get other ways, but um, you know, I mean that, and think about it. That's how we have Nosferatu. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I'm not advocating bootleg. If something's in print actively, get it. Get, you know, support these companies. Of course. But, you know, there's still a lot of films. There's still, so, there are films I love that I would actually are on my bucket list if they ever get out to do a commentary or like an essay for. Like, and I, there's a 1984 film called The Black Room, which is brilliant. It's a such a great movie. And there's really a muddy looking version on YouTube. I mean, I have it from a torrent. I don't even have the VHS of it, but I mean, there's nowhere to get it. Right. You know, I mean, there's so many films like that that still just are waiting. You know, they're so worth the time, you know? So I, I just think it's, it's important, you know, to get that, to get that out there, save as many of these, these films as we can. Completely agreed. Uh, gatekeeping to get back to it. We, oh, we've talked about, uh, no, you're good. This channel is all about going off on, on tangents. That's, that's like my bread and butter. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how you would respond to somebody that gatekeeps genres. Cause that's another thing that seems to be coming up a lot lately for, for example, a filmmaker I brought up earlier, uh, irreversible got mm -hmm. announced from indicator a year and a half or two years ago, whatever it was now. And it all sold out that limited edition long gone. Uh, plenty of people wanted to see it. And some people look at that and say, that is filth. How can you watch a woman being treated like that? That one scene is more than enough. Everybody should, not watch a movie with something like that in there. Other than the censorship argument, how do you respond to somebody that tries to gatekeep genres like that or rape revenge or? Oh boy. Yeah, that's something I've been encountering probably almost since the beginning. I mean, even in yeah. high school, I had a, my psych, uh, I was taking psychology and my teacher, and she had, she knew me when I was a baby. Like she'd know me, you know, and she was, 
she found it. I, she heard me telling somebody about the Wizard of Gore. No joke. <laughs> and she was legit horrified. She was like, Heather, oh my God. How could you? How could you? Because that's the thing. I was an honor roll student. I'd never gotten... I was totally boring little Miss Goody's Who Shoes that was just into some really weird, fucked up you know, art. I still am. That's still me to this day. Yeah. Um, and... Um, yeah, and she was like, I mean, you really thought she found out I like skinned people alive and made lamps out of them or something. Like she was like, How could you watch that? And I mean, Wizard of Gore is so much fun. And it's not so obviously not real. Like, God, like, but um no, I mean my thing, especially when it comes to sexism and you know, because that's the thing, I you know, love exploitation films and I love a lot of stuff, you know, like you know, golden age of adult, a lot of cult films, you know, horror. These are all subgenres that have always been very easy targets for people to come yeah. for when it comes to like how like women are treated. And my argument, like with sex exploitation, half of those, I would say more than half, a lot of those films, especially if you're talking like 60s and 70s, um, which is like the golden era, 50s too, um, a lot of those films, those are the only films you could see half the time if you wanted to see a woman that was strong and owned her sexuality. Like a lot of times, and even like with the roughies where it is like more like rapey, um, like you kind of have to approach them, they're pulp novels. They're basically sort of the cinematic version of pulp. I mean, you could also kind of realize that we lived in a culture that was so repressed that it was easier to get away with showing a woman getting raped um, than seeing a couple making love. And, you know, it's like the whole Lenny Bruce quote about, you know, it's okay if, if you know, Americans are fine if you see a, if somebody slice a woman's breast open, but if you caress it, oh, that's obscene. And, you know, and I think we still, people still have very much that puritanical kind of root with that. And that's the thing is like art is a mirror. I mean, that's an old cliche, but it's true. Like if you don't like something that's reflected in a film, whether it's irreversible or, you know, the defilers or whatever, look at the society you live in, you know, um, as far as how could somebody, yeah. I mean, as, I mean, even if you're just a horror fan, we've all, all horror fans have gotten that from people like, Oh, you're sick. Ew. And, you know, but I'm like, to me, it's like, well, horror, you horror gives you a safety zone to confront fear and to confront like sometimes the fantastic like horror can be really fun like when it's supernatural and you're kind of expanding and pushing the limits of imagination to all of its different sort of you know like inner you know psychological cortexes you can just really have fun with that uh but it also like you know say if you're afraid of spiders you can watch a movie about spiders and kind of confront your fear in a, in a way that's safe if you're afraid of yep. killers or anything um sometimes it can help you understand the people that scare you the most like you could watch something like joe spinell and maniac and see a performance that is so nuanced and, and gives you kind of an idea of like this person's a human being uh, is what they're doing right absolutely not but they're a hu they're still a human being and i think that is the scariest thing of all that somebody who's still a person, somebody you could run into in the street, talk to, have a good conversation with, could be doing something awful. It's terrifying. Yep. Um, but it's funny because I've had the same, some of the same people I've had come at me for loving horror over the years are people that love true crime. <laughs> and I don't like true crime. I'm not against it. I'm not a shamer, as I've said, but like, I'm like, I know the world's fucked up. I don't need to know this right. real shit. I know too much as the, it's, but I can watch angst and be fine. You know, like movies are a way for me to kind of, you know, deal with that. They're great coping mechanisms. Yeah. Um, you know, and sometimes, I mean, who wants to watch I mean, some people do want to just watch Disney films and watch, you know, safe for, you know, safe for work stuff or watch big budget Hollywood stuff. And that's fine. Like, honestly, a lot of the outro stuff isn't going to be like, if you're offended by irreversible, yeah, guess what? You're not the audience for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Gaspar Noe is not your dude. But at the same time, if it's not for you, don't go shit on somebody else's lawn about it. Like, I personally, I don't like rom coms. I would, I, I don't want to see some cutesy Meg Ryan y, <laughs> and Julia Roberts is the worst. I can't deal with her. But I'm not going to go out of my way to attack somebody online or in person and be like, oh, you like that. I might tease them a little bit, but it'll be with love, but I'm not going to just outwardly go after somebody. 
and be like, oh, well, uh, you know, why? Why? Life is short. Like a meteor could come and kill us all right now. Is that the last thing anybody wants to be doing with their life? Uh, I would hope not. So. Yeah. With, with art being reflective, a lot of these films are, uh, you know, reflecting a, a really big aspect of what we're seeing in politics right now. And that's the fact that if you don't, if I don't like a movie, you shouldn't be allowed to watch it, which is the same thing we're hearing about. If I don't believe you should have that right, you should not have that right. And it doesn't yeah. make any sense to dictate lives that way. It doesn't make any sense to dictate art that way. People have different experiences. And the sad thing is, is that's kind of the beauty about these films themselves, because it truly gives us those uh, doors to walk through to find these other experiences, these other cultures, these other uh, ways of life that maybe you won't see and could lead to you understanding why somebody would like some of these other things. A lot of these irreversible might be therapeutic for somebody who's been through something like that or a close family member has been through something or uh, seeing a film where they're, uh, you know, brutally murdered could bring a level of understanding and a level of coping for somebody who's gone through real tragedy. Th these films are made for a reason. And a lot of those ones that are subversive that you are potentially offended by somebody else watching they're there for somebody that will have real genuine emotions from it. And to take that away from them is to take away something profound. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Oh, man, I love that. No, that's such a great way to put that. Um, yeah. Well, and, and to be honest, kind of going back to like the whole history thing. Um, one of the things, one of the early things that got me interested, um, even in like my teens with like, especially like 50s and 60s, um, like exploitation films, because, was seeing a side of that era that we, that you're not like as Americans, we weren't really presented and still really aren't presented. Yeah. Like the fifties, especially where, you know, we're kind of presented with this very homogenized, like, you know, apple cheeked, you know, little, <laughs> you know, blonde tussled kids at the table and mom's a housewife and everything's very like, clean. Yeah. yeah, very leave it to beaver. Uh, but then like you could, you could, you know, you realize, no, no, people, there's always been something. I mean, you can go back to the 30s and 20s. Yeah. And I mean, some of the earliest films from the 18th, you know, when they started making films, the format, people were putting naked women in front. Of <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's humanity. And it's so it's kind of like, that's the other kind of neat thing is to be like, anytime somebody tries to be like, oh, the good old days, which by the way, that's a red flag and run. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, for so many reasons. But we have these, <laughs> we have these films as perfect of like oh i don't think it was quite like this because look at you know we have you know we can go back and watch you know i mean a lot of them are kind of more innocuous but you can watch like herschel grand lewis's scum of the earth you know and uh which has so much good dialogue <laughs> i love that movie because we really all do it you know damage merchandise and it is a fire sale so uh <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean and, and that's the thing like i mean i'm offended by forrest scout but i'm not gonna like go out and you know if somebody loves it good legit good if something makes you happy in this crazy life and it's not hurting anybody who cares like you know don't be nobody ever needs to be that person that's like oh and especially don't gatekeep in that way where it's like oh you like that no don't ever do that I, um and because you will get schooled because i i actually used to have like like some guys do that to me about liking heavy metal because you know and it's like and, it, and especially because they, they see like this girl they're super pale and got glitter or whatever and i don't have any glitter on now but you know i may at some <laughs> point and they're like oh you like and it's like oh have you heard a wasp and i'm like blackie lawless is awesome which album do you want to talk about or um sometimes it works in the favor though um i once had like these little like this is when i worked retail but these kids like these teenage boys that were like I heard them mention Judas Priest and I was like, my ears perked up. I love Judas Priest. And they're like, oh, you like Judas Priest name a song. And they're probably thinking I'm going to mention like, you know, breaking the law, like something like really big. And I was like, love yeah. bites off the of defenders of the of faith. And they're like, oh, and their eyes got big. They're like, you are the goddess. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes you can blow people's mind in a really positive way. But, um, but yeah, I mean, and they were kids too. I mean, if it's like some dude in his forties, it's like, okay, Bocephus, like, yeah, you need to simmer down, okay? Or, um, or God, Eric Clapton fans are really bad too. 
Because <laughs> Eric Clapton's terrible. <laughs> the worst that we're seeing of this is the the cliche dude walking around right now, seeing people with the band T-shirt and going, "Oh yeah, name three songs." And oh. it's, it's so aggravating and so juvenile to see. Oh my god, I know. I mean, and it's funny because I remember kids doing that when I was in high school. But it's like, yeah, they were kids right. in high school. Like if you're if you're grown up, don't. It is so true. It's like, you know, and you think if anything, like they would be excited, like exactly. to be like, oh, fucking A, you know, this girl's got a Dick Kennedy shirt on, or this guy has a Misfit shirt on, you know, it's, um, it, it's so, I mean, I get excited if I see somebody wearing cool merch. I'm like, you know, I mean, sometimes that works against you because then you'll like be like, oh man, and they end up being assholes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, but you never know until you try in life. So <laughs> you you brought up something a few minutes ago that I would be remiss if I didn't bring up just in case mm -hmm. the right people are watching. What are some of these bucket list titles? What is something that you want to work on that you haven't had a chance? Oh, to oh my God. That's such a wonderful question. Um, and it's going to be when I instantly, as soon as we get done recording, my brain is going to be like, you didn't mention this. <laughs> right. You didn't mention that. And I'll be like, oh, um, off the top of my head, of course, anything Sadian. Like, no, I mean, we got Calgary coming out. So that's obviously, but like Cafe Flash, Night Dreams, you know, one night dreams two or three party doll go go um those would be amazing uh the black room definitely uh mike mendez's killers which is a really great film um but uh oh gosh so you're saying that um any any michael finlay film especially the flesh trilogy um mm, this is such a oh my gosh erg music war Totally. Uh, which that did have a, a limited DVD release through the Warner Archive. Mm -hmm. But I would love it. I don't know if, if it would ever happen because of music rights. But that would be just oh, prime for the pickings for especially because like there's extra footage out there that have shown up in bootleg format. So like yeah. the elements got to be there. So that would be one. Um, you know, some of these already have releases out, but like, you know, Ray Dennis Steckler's uh, Lemon Grove Kids, Meet the Monsters. I would love to do that. Um, the Severn put out that gorgeous set. It's and amazing. it is gorgeous. Like, holy, oh, so beautiful. Um, <laughs> subspecies, I would love to do. Razor Blade Smile. Um, oh, God, I know. I hate, like, like there's so <laughs> many films. I'm like, oh, goodness. Um, Teenage Cruisers by Johnny Legend. I would love to do something for that um that's such a great movie so it's rockabilly it, it's it's my it's like i don't know if you're familiar with it we actually um projection booth uh we did an episode on it yeah. it was so much fun and um that film needs to be out because it's super out of print right now um but yeah God, I, I do love that movie um <laughs> jesus oh i hate this like <laughs> like oh god my brain is like locking up um Let, let's go for an easier one then uh okay. you, you have not gotten to work with a lot of uh all of the boutique labels are there any yeah. certain labels that you would just absolutely be super honored to be a part of obviously something like criterion or warner archive notwithstanding because a lot of people would just immediately dive if they approach you because they're so exclusive to get into some of those but some of these other ones i mean we we are literally so fortunate to have a plethora like almost too many boutique labels to keep track of nowadays are there any that you love that you would just love to be associated with oh god um any that'll have me i don't know because <laughs> they're because you're right i mean i can't even think of one that i would not want to work with because like right. and, and we're having all these kind of like smaller like sub labels coming out that yeah. are really cool like um i know there's like saturn's core which are doing like a lot of shot on video stuff um yeah which is a whole area of course all the bleeding skull people like that website's great and those writers have been doing just a great job preserving that area and just yeah. getting to learn about that um it's been so cool oh any ken russell movie is also on my bucket list but especially the devils or tommy if only yeah oh my god the, i know seriously <laughs> and i mean there, there are way bigger dogs that would ever get that if it does Hopefully, when it happens, we'll put that out there. Yeah. But, um, but I would love it. <laughs> um, boy, yeah, I mean, boy, any of them and anything. Um, 
I guess right now the one, the big one I would love to work with that I haven't worked directly with is the AFGA, the mm -hmm. American Film Genre Archive. Um, because they are just doing such great work and so many of their releases just speak to my heart. Of course, they've worked a lot with something weird, which yeah. I mean, something weird is like part of my, it almost feels like part of my bloodstream. I mean, I mean, I remember used to like, I used to like gaze at their ads and mo like monster magazines as a teenager thinking, oh my God, will I ever get to see these films, you know? And now of course, thanks to, you know, thanks to various things like DVDs and having money <laughs> like you, I do now, which is amazing, but not a lot, but it's, you know, it's there. Um, AFGA would be really cool. Uh, but really just like, I mean, they're all, we have so many people doing great work that, uh, you know, it'd be an honor. I don't, I think anytime anybody wants my opinion on anything, I'm always just very happy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good look at it. It. <laughs> it's so. a good way to look at these things because there's yeah. so many that uh, it's fortunate to be involved in the industry and the hobby in any way mm -hmm. but the the work that you're doing it would be nice to see on some of these other releases because you got a oh. unique voice a unique experience a unique background and uh the world deserves to hear more of it oh my goodness thank you so much that is uh, such a pleasure as my brain is still literally trying to <laughs> um oh also uh the world's greatest center the timothy carey movie though actually there's a lady marisa young who has um done so much research on him she should get that gig before me that's the thing i'm not i'm not too proud and i think a lot of us are like this where yeah um if we get offered something and someone we know we're not the right fit to be like but to try to pass that buck on you know it's like if you know i mean sometimes like you'll be like oh man i, I can't think of it off the top of my head but sometimes if you do you know sometimes you can help like a brother or sister get a gig you know exactly. or something who's gender neutral and it's beautiful and um so that's the thing i think and i think a lot of that happens a lot more than people realize it's kind of easy i think to just assume like oh drama but um and there's always drama but there's also like a lot of just like good you know just like yeah man let's just all like get some great work out there and support each other um and think of all the films i'm totally forgetting <laughs> that i want to cover oh the psychopath um 1972 aka eye for an eye have you seen this i believe at one point i did it's been a long time oh god it's so good that one is huge that one is high on my bucket list that's nice. it's so good psychotic kids show host that goes around avenging abused children oh maybe i'm thinking of something else then yes there was a loose um i don't know if you call it a sequel but there was an unfinished film with joe spinell called Mr. Rabby. And I think it was called like, they were trying to make it like Maniac 2 or something, but he plays the kids show host killing people. So it's obviously tied to it. But, um, which I love Joe Spinell. Like, Same. Yes. Any, anything with Joe Spinell, like I would do, I mean, any, any, even, even National Lampoon's movie madness. <laughs> yeah. And which is not good, but, um, but I mean, come on, it's Joe. Like Joe Spinell is the man. Who wouldn't want to talk about Joe? <laughs> I love talking to some of these contributors and discovering who that actor is. That the uh, the moment that they hear that name, they go, "Okay, yeah, I want to talk about it." <laughs> yes. Oh gosh. Yeah. Him. Timothy Carey is like, oh, like a godhead to me. He's like my Elvis. Uh, he. Oh god. The monkey's head would be another one. Um, I know Criterion did do that one, but it's only part of that box set. Right. And I have said way too many ridiculous things. Um, that not only have hindered any political career I've ever would have had, which I wouldn't because politics is a, as a pirate's lot. Uh, and I am no pirate. Um, even though I have bought bootlegs, <laughs> it torrents. <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> I just threw myself off with that. But um, or yeah, but I've, I've said a lot. I've, I, that's the thing. It's like, you'll, and have you done this? like with your show where you'll go like somebody will be like oh wow this thing you said and you're like i said that and then All you the think time. and then you're like oh shit i did say that <laughs> and then i'm like that's why i'll never get criterion because yep. you know that that and also like i mean i got projection booth to talk about water power and i think once you go into <laughs> enema bandit territory that's when people there certain entities are just going to be like uh yeah we're gonna go with the with this professor over here while potty math mcgee over there can go in her corner and talk about jamie gillis films where he's cleaning out bitches. <laughs> <laughs>
I gotta be me now. Come on, same one. <laughs> What's better than Jamie Gillis films, though? I mean, that's I love awesome. Jamie. I love Jamie Gillis, and he's a legit fantastic actor. So I will always go to bat for Jamie Gillis, and um, and he is one of the actors that have legit terrified me as I his movies too, <laughs> and and delighted me too. But um, but yeah, no, there's so many. Do you have an actor? Like, who's your like actor that makes you like go, oh my god? Ooh, uh, it was Jeff Bridges for a long time. Uh, oh, he's nowadays. Great. I, I think that uh, discovering some of the the smaller films of people that have gotten a lot of recent accolades and just, just kind of picking apart how they got to where they are. Like, Toni Collette's a, a real big one for me. Like, watching mm -hmm. her her old, like, New Zealand films from, like, 96 or long before The Sixth Sense, whatever, and seeing she was that good then. Just nobody gave her the opportunity to really there was no hereditary in 1995 or whatever. Mm. So she was only able to do what she had on the page, but just watching that evolution is something that I, I really love to grab onto. So th there's just a handful of those that, yeah, bringing up the name and I, I can see where they came from and where they got to now. It's, I don't know, maybe it's a, a sort of like a reverse empathy thing where I'm like, uh, sort of proud of, wow, they were able to, you know, start the seeds of what they wanted to do then and, and really flourish and, and grow to what they are now. I, I just love seeing mm -hmm. that success. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, she's great. I mean, it's it always is such a trip to me to see her and stuff now because I can still remember seeing Muriel's wedding. Yeah. And like, wow. And I mean, she's great in that. She's great in everything. She's incredible, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's very cool. There, There is something I would actually love to like learn a lot more about Australian cinema yeah. uh, in general because what i've been what i've seen i've loved and that also and please don't hate me for this but now see now the gears are going um the howling too because <laughs> i'm a big defender of that film and also um especially the music and i've, I've done a little bit of read i've done a lot of research on the the music um that i still need to incorporate into an article i guess but um uh, and uh shark treatment which i know eros put out a beautiful Ooh, release treatment, of yeah. but if it ever get, I mean, if we have like 80 different editions of Evil Dead, why not have one more shock treatment? You know, um, yeah. I love Evil Dead though, for the record, but, but you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah it's, it's like, the most exploited, exploited title on home video probably ever, that or Halloween, that or yeah, Suspiria, maybe. <laughs> and I love Suspiria, okay, I'm an Argento girl, but um, yes, oh, Death Row Game Show. <laughs> I would also love to do that, but um, I digress. <laughs> I completely get it. And some of those, yeah. like the Howling 2 is currently out of print in the U.S. I could see that getting an, uh, getting an updated release. Uh, I think Vinegar Syndrome hinted at possibly trying to get uh, 3, 4, and 5, like four or five years ago. They were trying to do a Howling box set. They've been very quiet since then, so maybe it fell through or something. But yeah, mm -hmm. that was, you never know. That could have been great. I can't imagine like a Howling 1 through 5 UHD box set or something coming out. That'd be oh, incredible. Just take my money. Like, <laughs> yeah. seriously. Oh, and um, yeah. I'm so sorry. This one more movie. <laughs> and I don't know why this one didn't come to mind immediately because it is legit a film I love so much. Um, like the only thing that would be bigger than this would be anything like Sadian related would be right. American Babylon by Roger Watkins. Interesting. Yeah. That's a, a huge film for me. So, um, but yeah. Interesting. Uh, last uh, sort of thing. I, I don't know if you know any insider information or whatever, but being so close to Sadian, th there's been a lot of rumors that cafe flesh is supposedly lost elements we're probably not going to get any blu-ray release anytime soon do you, do you know anything about that is there any hope that we could get something restored on that you think um i will say i hope uh i think there's there's always hope and uh, yes so um i i don't want to say any more than that because it's it's probably not my place and and I don't know all the details. There are people that are way closer to the the machinations of that. Um, right. But um, but I think there's definitely hope. Let's all knock on wood. I don't know anything 100, percent but you know, um, but I think there's hope. So hope is always a good thing. And uh, to end this, I will always just say, uh, be kind. I mean, there's so much mm -hmm. of 
the bullshit in the world that we all seem to be dealing with. I mean, it's the week of another mm. high profile tragic shooting in the, in the U S and we, we have so much other stuff to worry about that somebody liking a movie or a genre that you don't enjoy should be the absolute least of your worries. Absolutely. And I think that's so, yes, kindness is so needed. And I think the thing is like art you unites us. And that's why so many, so many of us get passionate and we're all from, so many of us are from different backgrounds and walks of life and it doesn't matter. We're, we're, we're brought together by this heart and just, yeah, I mean, people take care. We got to take care of each other. We need to support our, especially our communities that are constantly getting preyed upon and attack, like our, you know, our, our minority communities, like the LGBTQ yep. community, like the African-American community, like the Hispanic community and our lower and working class communities too. Like we got to take yep. care of each other. And because you know what? It's cheesy, but fuck it. We're all in this together. We truly are. So, you know, fight the real enemy, Don Henley. I'm joking. No, the real enemy is obviously not that. But I'm trying to add a little humor to it. But seriously, I love that. Let's all definitely be kind to each other. And, that was yeah. amazing. I may just cut it off after the word Henley right there. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you for your time, Heather. You have been an absolutely remarkable guest. I appreciate oh. you. And I hope to be able to have you on again someday. Well, thank you so much. I, I hope I did not disappoint. So. Not even remotely. You've been amazing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much.